We have put this workshop together on homeschooling for those people that are keen to know a little bit more about homeschooling. So we've got a couple of questions that people asked and uh, we just want to answer those. So it's more like a question and answer uh, um, session and uh, it's specifically like we said about the homeschooling. So if we look at our first slide there, it's quite interesting how different people you know, in different places observe homeschooling. So the first one there shows what my friends think I do, and then the next one is what uh, public teachers think I do, what the government thinks I do, what my mom thinks I do, and what I think I do, and what I really do. And it's giving you sort of a perspective of what it is really like to homeschool. So let's move to our next slide there. And our first question is, what does it mean to homeschool? What is homeschooling not? So homeschooling is very, very interesting because it works very much uh, in a different way from a school setup. The parent works one-on-one -on -one with the child, uh, focused on the child's preferred learning style and timing of day that works best. Uh, children can learn at their own pace. Uh, once they have mastered one section, they can move to the next section. When children and parents start homeschooling, they need to adjust to each other and become more relaxed so that they can fall into the right rhythm. This is very, very important. Many people that start homeschooling, it gets suggested to them to actually just take about six months to actually just relax into the process of homeschooling. Parents can set a goal and an intention for homeschooling to inspire their children on their journey. So it's very important to understand that uh, the parents' intention with homeschooling is very important. If you're just thinking, well, you know, it's, it's really just going to be a quick solution or you're not going to really put in that much effort, then, yeah, that is going to be a bit of a problem because children need uh, their parents. So you are going to have to sacrifice some of your time during the day. But the rewards are amazing in the long run. Okay, parents can access the child and go back to the revision where necessary and take some time to master the work. So this is another thing that works differently with homeschooling. In a school uh, situation, we have to keep to a specific pace and teachers are really under a lot of pressure to complete a certain amount of work in a certain amount of time. Uh, where with the child that's homeschooled, we only move on to the next work when the child has mastered that specific part. So what one gets is you get more of a solid foundation and sometimes kids go much faster uh, with uh, work uh, and sometimes they go a little bit slower. But uh, one, one really has a more of a solid understanding of the work before new work is uh, introduced. So in the, the transition between primary school and high school is also interesting because it's a little bit more gradual. Uh, if, we, if we look at boys and girls separately, they reach plateaus in their development. Uh, for girls, normally it's when they start developing, and it's normally in primary school that they have the plateau. Uh, what's interesting there is it takes quite a, you know, uh, a slower pace in, in primary school, which is great for the girls, because then as they are not really pressured, during that developmental phase. But with boys, it normally hits them in high school where the pace is much faster and girls uh, generally have adapted uh, easily to high school than boys do. And by the time boys really are back on track uh, with their development, they have so much work to catch up on it, it's really quite hard for them. So the first time I heard about this sort of plateau phase was from Leonard uh, Wistrom, but he's the one that um, really worked hard in the, I think it's 1994 to 1996, around right about there, to get um, homeschooling legal in South Africa. So he also started the Pestalozzi Trust. So for those that want to find out more about the legal aspects, uh, we will mention it later on as well. Please go and look at their website um, and you can get um, hold of those that are um, continuing his good work. So another thing to understand is, yes, we, a lot more parents have become aware of learning styles. They understand that we've got our visual learners and our kinesthetic learners. They understand it up to a certain degree. But there's also the different intelligences. And I think it's difficult in school situation, uh, but it's very important to understand each child. And in your homeschooling situation where you 
are at home, it's much easier to then cater for those specific intelligence that their children have and you know start working towards what are their strengths and we know if a child's strengths are uh, reinforced their weaknesses will also be uh, bettered and we see an improvement in um, all subjects um, when one focuses mostly on you know the individual child so if we, we go to our next slide there so why have some parents started homeschooling that's an excellent question you know, it's, it's important that we understand that the power of choice is very important, that all of us should have the ability to be able to choose, and that for specific families, specific decisions or choices will be better than for others. And that doesn't make anybody better than anybody else. But what we've got at the moment, if we've got mostly government and private schools, and we know that this has been good for some children, we definitely see that in their performance and the way that they enjoy it. But some children are still underperforming. So branch and practitioners and facilitators, as well as some homeschooling parents, have come to realize that children have different brain organizations and learning styles, which most schools do not take into consideration or cannot incorporate uh, the changes in their classroom. So we get children uh, brain organization. What we mean by that is... Every person has the ability to reorganize themselves, specifically on the brain level, for, for different subjects. So some children will experience some ch uh, challenges with certain subjects and find them more difficult and, and therefore carry more stress and find it more difficult to learn in those specific subjects than others. So this is also a slightly influenced, of course, by their interest. But um, if they're picking up any tension in the class or their teacher's not explaining things to them in a way that makes sense to them, this can cause stress. And these children then struggle to actually uh, take in the information and make it part of who they are. And we do need to understand that uh, our teachers are very much under severe pressure from different sides. Even the parents put pressure on the teachers, the, the principal, the system, the curriculum and the government. And they need to provide loads and loads of documentation, which makes it difficult to actually uh, engage with the children on the level that they first wanted to. And it, it restricts their ability to just enjoy learning or teaching rather, the learners. Um, so we, we really find that that's a very, very hard for them. So one does really have compassion for uh, the teachers and, and they sit with lots of children in their classrooms as well. Um, and this is like once again a, a, a plus point for homeschooling that we're actually working on one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, another thing that's interesting is a lot of people think of homeschooling as a school at home. And it's very, very different to that. We, we really, as homeschooling parents, are, are creating a more relaxed environment for that child to um, enjoy learning more and become curious more. And we see that. That's why there's that period of time that we say, well, just get used to your child, see what they're interested in and see how they work. Find a rhythm between the two of you so that you can support that child. So looking at the next slide there, choosing homeschooling, every child has the capacity to learn and it's definitely a gift that we've got, that we, we have that capacity. The ability to learn is a skill and so that needs to be developed. Um, the willingness to learn is a choice. What we see is if we're working with these children, they start uh, becoming aware of their capacity and that they can learn and they develop stronger skills and of course in turn make better choices for themselves. And most parents who choose homeschooling um, or home education for their children go through a tedious research process before starting their journey. And this is what we have found quite a lot, um, that people think, oh my gosh, this mom or dad or whatever has just decided to just homeschool uh, overnight. And we actually don't find that. We find that the most parents are actually, you know, been looking at homeschooling for quite some time, reading up about it, meeting people that are homeschooled, um, seeing what they're about, and seeing if their child will fit into that whole process and adjust accordingly. So it really is important to realize that parents take time to, to make that decision. 
it really is important to, to realize that parents are not just making an uh, overnight decision, uh, they really look at it extensively. It's interesting to also mention here that I've had uh, chats with various parents and they say, oh my gosh, I really think it's amazing that you're homeschooled f for all these years, but I could never homeschool. And, you know, one asks the question, well, do you do home um, homework with your child? And most parents say, yes, I actually do. And I say, well, then you actually are homeschooling or home educating your child. Knowing the school system and how hectic it, it can be, you can um, really understand why children need homework and why it gets sent home. It's because there is a repetition that needs to take place, which is very, very interesting to consider when you do homeschooling. So there are a few considerations that one needs to make, uh, to name a few of these uh, factors, uh, when one has to look at socialisation. And interestingly enough, the homeschoolers have quite a lot of support groups um, and these support groups organise outings in their area. Um, so moms meet up and they do wonderful outings with their children, like go to the reptile or the war museum or the zoo. And they do this together in groups. Another thing to consider is testing and exams. That will have a lot to do with what kind of curriculum or a method you choose to, you know, work with your child. Um, community involvement, we find that our homeschoolers are more involved in the community and more aware of what's going on. Homeschooling is absolutely fantastic when it comes to special needs. There's not a lot in South Africa that we know of that offers a special needs facility for children. Um, so parents are under a lot of pressure in that specific area. And if mom can work from home and also homeschool the child, she can uh, really do a lot. Special needs is also a very interesting term because every child is special and every child has needs and there's nothing wrong with that. So when we talk about special needs, this child doesn't necessarily maybe fall on the autistic spectrum or uh, necessarily has a, um, a challenge with certain abilities or has different ha abilities from others. But what we see is that their needs get met and we want to actually you know, make an awareness there when, when children are struggling with their immune system or they are really super intelligent and learn very fast. School can be very frustrating for them. Another thing to consider is registration. Uh, it is required in South Africa that you do register. If you want to contact the Pestalozzi Trust to see what options you have um, and talk to them about it, uh, they are on the forefront of what is happening legally with that, so best to contact them. All right, then our next question there is, parents are concerned about socialization. What is the impact of homeschooling on socialization? And before we start really going into that, I think it's important just to uh, uh, define the term socialization. And I went and I looked it up, and socialization means to mix, get together, fraternize, keep company, go out, get out, associate, hobnob, rub shoulders, or like they say in the USA, to rub elbows. Socialize means to act in a sociable manner. So in considering these definitions of socialization, one starts getting an idea why some parents decide to homeschool or home educate their children in the first place. So what's interesting around this is that children mostly learn the ability to connect from their mother. So you see in relationships, if the mother's there and she's, you know, she's dealing with the children and from the, you know, the small baby, that baby and child learns to connect uh, through the mother's interaction. So the mother is actually the one that lays the foundation for this ability to connect. So if I can connect with somebody, then I can take it to the next step. And children mostly learn friendship from their dads. So dads are the ones that are, you know, rough and tumble outside, play with the children and connect on that level. So what's really, really nice in a homeschooling environment where they're fortunate enough to have mom and dad, um, that there's more uh, time to actually interact as a family. And these wonderful um, skills of socialize, to socialize properly is then put into the family unit where it's supposed to be. 
So we know in uh, child development, if you look at how children develop, they start off playing very independently from each other and only around about five, around about there, they start actually playing with someone. Before that, it might just be parallel play. And um, so they really are uh, needing to have their mom and dad, uh, you know, give them these skills. So as the mom goes out and she interacts with other people, the child observes that and learns from that. And we know this, that children really copy what we do. Like they normally say, I don't do what um, I do, but do what I say. And we know children don't do that. They observe us as parents and then they are able to interact accordingly. So we have got a very important part to play when it comes to uh, children being able to act in a sociable manner. So which is very, very exciting. Um, and it doesn't matter if your child's in school or not. Uh, remember the, the, the discipline of your child um, and the way your child has uh, interaction with others is very much your responsibility as a mom or dad to instill uh, the correct way of doing things so that that child can benefit later on in life and be a valuable member of society. So what we did with this question is I've just put together a typical 12-hour day. So what happens typically at school and what happens typically at a home school? So looking at um, point one there, uh, at school, the social time during the day, school children socialize at school with their own age group, mostly during break time, which averages between 45 minutes, if they're lucky, an hour and a half uh, per day, where they can really just interact with their friends. We homeschooling children have more flexible hours, but mostly spend about two to six hours a day doing their schoolwork. Primary school, um, is about two hours. We see that mom is busy with the children and high school we see between four and six hours depending on the curriculum that the parents have chosen. Okay, so number two there, point two. Uh, social grouping uh, for a year. Children are grouped together by teachers who divides them into classes according to different criteria for a whole year. These children are generally from the same area or socioeconomic group. Homeschool children, on the other hand, uh, need to interact with their siblings and or other children, as well as parents who accompany them on outings. So there's a little bit more exposure to different kinds of children, different parents and different age groups when it comes to homeschooling. So homeschooling children really need to be able to interact with uh, other parents, um, maybe somebody that's older, definitely children that are younger than them. And this is quite nice, actually, because what we see in the work environment is that none of us have ever worked at a work where every single person we work with is exactly the same age as we are. We, we have to then learn to interact with maybe um, like a boss or a CEO or somebody that's older than us or maybe someone that's younger than us. And so there is quite a lot of challenges um, with interacting with different ages. And we see that... Our children at school are a little bit more shy to interact or a little bit more uncomfortable, let me rather say it like that, to um, interact with people that are much younger than them or a lot older than them. Looking at point three there, socialising um, and discussions in class. During class time, discussion and socialization are discouraged at schools as this can be disruptive to teachers as they need to complete a specific amount of work in a time period given and all children need to pay attention. Um, otherwise, there's chaos. You know, if you've got 40 kids in your class, you really need them to pay attention so that at least some of the learners can then hear what's going on. What is happening at the home school? There's more one-on-one -on -one time available and discussions are encouraged and can continue throughout the day as time allows. Interesting to bring in here that some profiles very, very much need to discuss uh, questions. They will discuss topics. So they process by talking. So if they get the information, they're only really processing it properly when they're able to discuss it with a friend or 
uh, in a group. And this is not always uh, allowed at a school and can be misunderstood as well that the child is wasting time or uh, not paying attention. So we get a lot of these children um, that struggle in the school environment because they don't grasp the work because they weren't able to talk about it and discuss it. So let's look at point four there, right times to socialise. In some traditional schools, children can receive punishment uh, for, for socialising with other children at the wrong times, um, which we just covered previously. So it's important that children can get penalised um, for learning in a way that's natural to them. Um, they're not doing it on purpose, but the school system needs to function in a specific way that doesn't cater for that. At homeschool, uh, homeschooling children have more opportunity to observe adults socialising. This gives them the practical exposure to guide them in their own socialisation. So here we, we just reiterating that point that we mentioned earlier, that children are actually looking up at parents. And the more exposure the child has to a parent and seeing their interaction when they go to the shops or answer the phone, or talk to a friend, or meet a new person, or interact on various levels, the more the child knows how to handle those specific situations later on. Okay, point five there. At school, peer-dominant environment, the socialization is in a peer-dominant environment, putting children at a higher risk, for example, to ongoing bullying and other bad behavior. At homeschool, children don't necessarily escape bullying, etc although they are exposed to bad behaviour a lot less. The parents are normally close by, so matters tend to not escalate as easily. So, yeah, very important. My children have never been to school, but they were also confronted with having to deal with children that are more dominant and wanting their own way, and it teaches them wonderful uh, ways of handling situations. But us as parents are normally close by, so they can ask us. Children that of course get a little bit older, high school, they tend to go on outings and whatever. It's a lot more easier for them on their own, although parents still accompany them. Okay, at uh, number six here, the school has got a more of a passive school environment. Children can more easily become passive and compliant in a school environment. So there's a tendency to spoon feed children at school. I know some schools are really on top of that and they do their best not to. Teachers, uh, you know, that are passionate, that we've got some fantastic teachers, and they really do their best to uh, bring an awareness. But the majority of the children are just become more and more uh, uh, compliant and, yeah, passive. We with homeschoolers, there is more of a challenge for them to become more active and independent. They tend to be challenged more in doing um, chores around the house. Very interesting to go look back at Google if you want to and search uh, what was the skill level and the chore levels of children, say for example in the 1950s or so, um, or 100 years even ago. And one can see that the, the level of skills that children had then uh, you know, and what they could do supersedes what our kids are able to do now. Um, so very important to go look back at that and see what children are able to do, what is age appropriate, and, you know, encourage them because if they can do chores and they can do their own washing and know how the washing machine works and etc., it builds a kind of a confidence in them. And, you know, if children are in the house all the time, they actually do contribute to quite a lot of a mess and you know just living um, so it's important for them to realize that if I uh, mess up a certain area it is my responsibility to clean it up because otherwise there's a, a really a big burden on the, the parents to clean and especially the mum if she's with the children all the time uh, we, we really encourage children to say no assist your mom let's do the homeschooling together but everybody does their own chore this is also fantastic to start developing their work ethic and get them towards building character. So when we started homeschooling about um, 20 years ago, uh, character was the most important aspect considered. Because if you've got character, you will be a better doctor, a better lawyer, a better pilot, a better plumber even, or any of those skills. 
you will definitely be better at that. And this is what we need in our society, people with strong characters and good value systems. In this specific point, it's very important to remember that parents can get busy and you need to guard against uh, children having ex excessive cell phone and computer use. Uh, my children were definitely not very impressed with me on, when they were younger because I did not really allow them extensive hours on their cell phone or computer and they thought it was very unfair but now looking back later on in life they actually came back to me and said they're so grateful uh, because they were um, in a way encouraged to play more due to that and interact more and they see now that their peers that they are dealing with now and interacting with now that spend huge amounts on computers and playing computer games have not developed the social skills to easily interact and connect um, and also the interest base only stays with games they don't really have a, a wide interest base so it's really important to take in consideration that for a child to be socially active, they also need to be able to interact and talk about various things. So wonderful if they've got a nice, broad, general knowledge and they can interact with anybody and talk on a topic. And it gives them more confidence. So it's really a, a lovely thing. But of course, the parents have to set the parameters and give the guidelines for that. So number seven here, during afternoons children do extra murals mostly with the same children they socialized with in the morning. In the late afternoon or evening, homework needs to be completed. And this can take up to four hours depending on the grade. So what we see with school kids is they are constantly under pressure to perform. Um, and, you know, it's just really hard even in the evenings because they still have to complete their schoolwork. So homeschooling uh, children tend to have a, a different framework so they don't need to have homework as much because it's been completed as part of their schoolwork uh, in the morning. Uh, this leaves more time to spend together as a family and of course more opportunities to organize their own social activities as they get older. So the children start learning um, from the parents. So if the parent you know, has different outings that they organize, then the children pick up those skills from the parent and then they start developing and by the time they get to high school afterwards uh, they can then put their own social event together and engage in social activities. We see with homeschoolers as well they, they will maybe have cricket club or which where they will mix with a certain amount of children and they might have another hobby or another interest or where they meet a different set of children. So there is a little bit more of a mixture with different kinds of children and different parents. So now let's go to point three. What are some of the mistakes uh, we made when considering homeschooling? I think one of the biggest mistakes is to look at uh, every child and measure them against an average child. So the first time I heard about the average child was from Leonard from Wistrom from the Pestalozzi Trust, as I mentioned earlier. And he unfortunately, like I said, has passed away. But he taught us very nicely that the average child doesn't exist. And asking the whole audience that he spoke to, he said, has anybody got an average child? And it's very clear that nobody has. Every single child is a unique. And everybody learns in a different way. Thinking that everybody learns the same way uh, is is dangerous because we as parents might have a specific learning style or learning method that worked for us at school but we need to understand that our child might be very different you might be lucky and you might have say your children all learn the same way you do which is very lucky but what we see with a lot of families is they need to adjust the mom needs to become aware of how different her ch children are and how to work with each one. And of course, if children need so much individual interaction on their learning style, think about the pressure for a teacher. There is no way she can get to everyone. And that's why they do what they do in the school system. Another thing is to, to think that, you know, when, once you start homeschooling that you're not going to make mistakes. 
Uh, every parent, every teacher, every human will make mistakes. Uh, it's best to learn from them and move on, but it's part of the journey and it's important to be gentle to with yourself. And that's why it's lovely being part of a support group because you get to speak to other moms that might have the same issue or a similar child or that work, learns in a similar way and you get a lot of input from each other. Another thing is one size fits all thinking, thinking, well, you know, every child must have the same curriculum or the same approach. Every child really needs to be looked at uh, individually. And this impacts the next point, they're buying a curriculum in a hurry. So if the mom and the dad looks at a curriculum, they might say, oh, well, this works really well, because maybe that's the way they learn. And they're thinking, oh my gosh, this, was, this would be a, have been fantastic for me at school. But really, you need to consider what will work with the whole family before you go spending a lot of money in a hurry. So rather take your time, figure out your children, maybe have a brain profile done from somebody that has knowledge about homeschooling and then connect together with that person to get an idea of how your ch child is working and how you can better support them uh, in their process. Correction before connection is really, really important because if we come in and we just want to correct a child, say, oh my gosh, this child uh, can't be in school, can't work, and you're thinking, I'm going to teach this child how to, to do these things and co make corrections, that could possibly break up your relationship even more or make your relationship more fragile. So the best thing to do is connect with that child Find out what that child's about, what is the interest. So spending time together, going on outings is fantastic because you get to see what the child is enjoying and connect with them. And out of that connection, you will then be able to correct the child in their behavior and what they're doing um, with better success. Okay, next one there is comparing children with each other. Most people realize that their children are all different. But the danger comes in to saying, well, if you could only just be like your brother, or if you can only just be like your sister, or if you can only be like the other family's children. So just be very careful to compare children with each other. And it is a temptation. It is a temptation as a homeschooling mom, you meet another homeschooling mom, and if they want to say, oh my gosh, my child is so fantastic, then the comparing thing starts happening. Well, your child is not that academic, or your child is not this. Or So having knowledge of the intelligence is also equips you as a parent to have confidence in your child and trust your child through their process. I saw a very interesting talk of a homeschooler that is already... Uh, part, you know, went through school, it was in America, and it was a YouTube video, and she was explaining that, you know, parents need to trust children, and that they will follow their heart, and I think what sometimes is difficult is children go through that plateau phase that we talked about, where it seems like they're not really active, once they sort of get to high school, then it's like, oh my gosh, they re don't really want to do anything, and they don't want to cooperate, and what one needs to see there is see them in their developmental phase. Uh, what, we, what I've observed about other children and my own, that sometimes the, the work ethic really, the character should be there, but sometimes the work ethic only really kicks in maybe 15, 16 years of age. And all of a sudden they then start working like crazy, and then you get children finishing two, uh, two years in one year which is incredible, and you just see how they escalate. Some children have a natural ability to just get with the work. They're very task-orientated. Um, some of them actually finish school early, but there is a temptation for parents to think, oh my gosh, I'm going to push my child to finish uh, earlier because maybe they can finish matric at 16. The child does need to be emotionally ready for that as well. So if you're interacting with your child a lot and working on emotional issues in your own life as a parent, your children will then learn from you. Another uh, big mistake that I think also happens is parents think learning is a mental activity only. And this is quite dangerous because this is actually where a lot of things go wrong. We get children that are mentally uh, you know, not ready yet because of their physical 
components that are not in place. Okay, another mistake we tend to make as parents is that we think learning is a mental activity. So here is definitely a golden key to understanding that if the physical components of the child is not in place, the mental process or academic skills will not come to the fore um, because that is the natural development. So a nice metaphor to use is if you think of this light switch. So if you go to the wall and you switch the light on in the room, you want to see the light going on. And what happens a lot of the time is the teacher or the parent is at the light switch of the child turning this light switch on and off and the light doesn't go on. And they feel that if they continue to, to flick the light switch, that any moment the lights will go on. And what is actually happening there is there might not be any wires or they might not be connected in the roof. So one can't just keep switching lights on and off, one needs to actually go and check, is the physical components, is the neurological system in place so that um, academic uh, skills can develop? Because if the physical components aren't there, the academic components will come, won't come in. So many times people are so focused on, yes, we need to have this fantastic curriculum that they've not looked at the basic development and in our society children's movements are restricted more and more and we need to bring in a, a movement curriculum and some fantastic movement curriculums that's being trained and I personally train as well as brain gym as one and we get a rhythmic movement training where the physical components of the child is developed so that they can have the academic skills come in because it's a higher cognitive ability. So another way of doing it as well is also letting the children play more um, outside and having lots of activity. But if there's already issues, then it's, it really is simple movements that have the right intention and the uh, specific that actually reconnects the brain. So that's really worth investigating to um, really bring in those physical components and not ignore them. So going to slide four, will homeschooling work for everyone? Yes, I think every parent, if they put their mind to it, can homeschool. The problem is we've got schedules, we've got tension levels, we've got parents uh, struggling with their own issues. So it is a huge sacrifice. So it's very important to realize what your options are and this is the most important thing. The most important thing on earth is the freedom to be able to choose. So if you attempt homeschooling and it doesn't work for you, you can go take your children back to school. Or if um, homeschooling is a better option for you that you can choose. No one is necessarily better than the other. It's what's best for your family. So we just got a little comic strip there about teaching and learning. Um, it says that I taught stripes how to whistle uh, and the friend replies, I don't hear him whistling. I said I taught him, I didn't say he learnt it. And this is what we're getting. We're getting a lot of children being taught but it doesn't mean they've necessarily learnt. So learning is very much an experience or needs to be an experience. So if we think back um, as adults to a time period where we were it may be in matric, some people can remember. Um, but if you were asked, what did you write for your Afrikaans essay, for example, in matric, uh, very few people will remember. But if I asked you, uh, can you remember your matric farewell, you will say, yes, I, I can. Can you remember what you wore? Can you remember what, uh, where you went? And so interesting, so that's almost the same time period in your life. So how come you remember the one more than the other? It's because your matric farewell was more of an experience. So if the person actually experiences the learning on a deep level inside who they are, it's much more difficult to forget. And what we find we get at schools is the information is never really experienced. It's just head knowledge or a rote memorization that takes place. So it doesn't really ever become part of the individual as it should. 
You get those with profiles that, of course, take in, in information much easier. You get people with photographic memory, and I've, we've even heard about a child that she's got such a fantastic photographic memory, she literally can see the book and find the answers to the questions when she writes an exam. But even she said, you know, I don't really always know what's going on in the information. Um, I also had one mom tell me that when she was at university, she knew how to study and she could remember easier. But she definitely didn't see herself as somebody that knew the topic as well as some of the others that didn't get as a high score in the uh, exams. So these are uh, different sort of facets that you've got to look at. Um, there are moms that are working full time. They get a, a, a tutor, train their child. So you can also use that option to get a tutor in. What's very really important there is the tutor actually needs to come to your house. Um, and um, some moms say, oh my gosh, if I have to pay for six hours, that's very, very long. So not necessarily. You... Uh, Remember what we said in the previous slide? We said it takes about pre, uh, primary schools about two to f two hours of uh, work. Your most important work to cover is, of course, your maths and your language. We always encourage people to upkeep that. So, yeah, question five do we need a curriculum? So, curriculums are interesting. We get a lot of people and a lot of commercialization has taken place in. In homeschooling, when I first started, there wasn't very many options, and since then, people have uh, realized that there's a whole homeschooling community, and they, of course, pursue their curriculum to market it to the homeschoolers. What's very important to understand here is that you actually want to find out what specific method of homeschooling will match your child before you purchase a curriculum. Um, and that you investigate properly, that they don't say, yes, we do have pictures for the visual learner, and we do have this, and we do have that, that you actually make sure that you get what you're looking for. But always start from the point of view from the child. What method of homeschooling will work best for your child? Because then if you buy a curriculum and it matches your child's ability and how they learn, even when they're under stress, they will be able to learn quite well. And then you don't have a, a scenario where uh, parents are buying curricula six months down the line, children are stressed out, mother's burnt out because she's worked, uh, she's become a slave to the curriculum and children are hating it. And then they can't use and they've wasted all that money. So really investigate, take your time to investigate all the different curriculums based on the different homeschooling methods. So... Like we said earlier, learning needs to become an experience and uh, it does for the child if the senses are used in their learning. So let's have a look at a couple of different methods. So the first method we've got there is our textbook method that uses both textbooks and work text as each subject is separated from the other subjects with the time frame allocated to each subject. So day by day, work needs to be completed until the school year is finished. The manual and answer keys and teacher's guide are normally supplied with such a curriculum. This method is more suitable for left-leading open brain organizations. This works well as a school at home setup. So yes, we do get children that enjoy a very structured approach to their learning and they need specific times where to start and they need that structure. So this textbook method would be really great for them and then if you know that your child is left uh, leading open brain organization then you know that a textbook method will be really good. So if you are not aware of where to go to get your child's brain organization you can contact me uh, or Hilandri. we will have our contact details on the classroom so contact us uh, drop us a message down below um, and then we can put you in contact with somebody that can do a very thorough brain organization with your child and assess their profile correctly within the home schooling framework so if we look at number two there the delayed academic method 
goes against the normal educational tide. In their research, Dr. Raymond and Dorothy Moore conclude that children learn at their own pace and learning the three R's, reading, writing and arithmetic is better late than early unless the child is really keen and ready. This method is more suitable for a mixed brain organization. This method works well in a more homely and relaxed setup. So yes, this is just an interesting thing that um, when I started homeschooling my children, you know, I of course chatted to my dad and you know, sometimes family can really be negative about it. But my dad was very, very positive. And I asked my dad, when did he start uh, reading? And he said, because he's a very keen reader, he, he never put a book down. Um, he was always keen to read a new book or interested. And so very different from what I've experienced other people around me, other uh, specifically um, guys around me. They, they don't have that a keen sense of reading. So my dad said uh, they, he only learned to read at age 13. And I thought that was quite interesting because a lot of our children, like I mentioned, they learn to read earlier and earlier now and children hate reading. They don't want to read. Uh, they'd rather just play video games or whatever. So it's very important to understand, like Dr. Raymond and Dorothy Moore wrote a book. The whole book does quite a lot of extensive research that most children, doesn't matter at what age they start reading, um, at 16, most children read exactly the same speed and amount of words. This hopefully will comfort some parents that maybe your child's a little bit uh, slow on the reading side. Uh, keep developing that physical component. Get in touch with someone that understands uh, what to do physically. And then you'll see the reading will come into place very nicely. Number three there, the unit study method is an extensive a study of one topic or a unit integrated into all subjects. The purpose behind this method is to apply and interconnect the knowledge gained. This is a very natural way to learn. The method works well in a family. All the different ages in a family can all work on one unit at their own skill level. Fathers more easily participate, bringing in family closer together. With this method, there is less preparation time required. This method is more suitable for families that need to cater for different grades and learning styles within their family. So the unit study method is really great. Um, um, it spills over a little bit in other methods as well. We, we see that and sometimes more than one method is used within a family. The one little boy that I worked with went through a phase of being super interested in the Titanic. And, you know, we were investigating videos on the Titanic and made drawings of the Titanic, uh, investigated what happened and who was on the ship and who survived. And so an extensive search on information and how, uh, from different angles, what was the construction? Why did the... Uh, the Titanic sink and um, you know, this went on and on and on and I remember the mom saying when will he ever be finished with the Titanic and it means he was so interested in it it really was an interest field of his and this is why we learn as well we also become interested like you guys in becoming homeschooling parents or home-based education you're looking at that and what will you start doing? You will start investigating, asking people about it, talking to people that have already done it, looking on the internet. So it's a really natural way of learning. And what we've seen is if, if people sort of complete the one section of what they're interested in, then it leads to the next. And that is how you then gain a fantastic general knowledge. And, you know, children, if, say, for example, you're doing the Titanic and the one child does a drawing because they're only six and the other one does a, a, a model and builds it because they're a little bit older. Um, so you can cater for all the different learning styles in here, but also age groups and skill levels. But you still give them the same information. So it saves a lot of time doing the unit study method. Number four, the unschooling method poses that if the right opportunity is created, children will naturally learn what they need to know. With this non-structured method, parents create a learning environment with easy access to plenty books 
and other needed resources. An available parent is there to answer any questions and notice the interest of the child. The child is more free to play and learn and move when they need to. This method is more suitable for mixed and open right leading brain organizations. So the unschooling method is something that I did use for a couple of years, especially going from, say, primary school to high school with my son. And he did incredibly well. He gained huge amounts of knowledge with this method. And I think the, the term sometimes scares people when it's unschooling method. And there are other names for unschooling method. But basically, uh, it doesn't mean the child doesn't have access to books and needed resources. It means the parent is really becoming the facilitator, observing the child and being there, oh, I want to read this book, or oh, I'm interested in that. And the learning um, is encouraged uh, from, from the child's motivation. So we get a very much a self-learning ability skill that's developed through this. So this is fantastic because if the child is motivated to learn with in themselves, they motivate themselves from inside to learn and they become enthusiastic and curious again, you have really got an easy time coming. So if your learning um, ethic kicks in at the same time or at a later stage, what you've got is you've got a self-initiated learner with an excellent work ethic. And that is a very, very easy way of getting somebody through high school. Um, but to remember, like I said previously, this can only sometimes kick in at age 16 and might even be later. Uh, I went to talk uh, of a professor that worked at WITS and he mentioned, you know, that children normally only really know what they really want to do at an age 21. So they get a lot of students that come in to the university and they I've chosen something and they study for a couple of years and then they actually go into another field because they weren't quite ready yet. So there's a lot of pressure on uh, like our 18, 19, 20 year olds. Um, what do we always do when we, we see a child? Or what are you? How old are you? And what grade are you in? Are you studying? Have you got your drivers? It's all these measuring questions that we pose to these children. And they might not always be ready. Maybe they're working on a different part of their de development, a social development, or um, becoming more interested in that part, or developing a specific topic. And the more they're exposed to different topics as well, and in the unschooling method, the more they understand where they fit in. So the more exposure, the more um, you give them different subject matters, the more they'll say, well, I'm really interested in this or I'm really interested in that. And, and I'm not just meaning uh, um, video games because I know a lot of children, that's the first thing they choose. Oh, I love video games. We're looking more at what makes your child unique. There is just so many children that are excited about video games. And I can't think uh, every child is so unique that that is... Um, the leading thing to do. So, very interesting. Then number five, there's the Charlotte Mason method. Encourages the use of whole and living books that have real life experiences written by novelists that include history, biology, geography, science and other subject facts. With this method, learning is from bi biographies and historical novels instead of textbook style and rote memorization, but rather from the reader to identify with the personal experience of the author. Charlotte believed in a structured uh, morning of basic academics and after noon with real life situations, outings, nature walks, visits to museums. This is to make learning an enriching and joyous experience. Charlotte is well known for her tool called narration, where the child is required to listen and then retell the reading as closely as possible. Copy work is also used. This method is more suitable for open ear and hand organizations, as well as those that benefit from fine motor experiences. So this is such a fantastic method, the Charlotte Mason method. It, it does incorporate a little bit of a kind of a unit study method approach, but it, it moves from a historical point of view. And we know history repeats itself. So the boys I work with at the moment, we, we work from a very strong history base. And it is so interesting to see how they can um, 
compare it with the current situation in, in, in different countries and whatever. So they, they're learning from history. they got an understanding of what is happening around them because of this. And it's a, it's a really fun approach to, to take this Charlotte Mason method. Number six is the classic method is based on the model used in the Dark Ages. In 1947, Dorothy Swayer suggested this to be a good method as education was failing to teach children the art of learning and how to think for themselves. This method is more suitable for open left leading brain organizations. So this is what we, a lot of parents want to achieve. And this is once again bringing the intention in. They want to achieve a child that can think for themselves, that doesn't just get spoon fed. They are actually able to look at information, able to take it in and then draw a conclusion from that to make good decisions and also solve uh, problems more easily and make plans. So this is a wonderful approach for our left leading brain organizations. All right, number six here, which curriculum do we follow if we decide to use one? So your considerations that I think you need to look at is, you know, children are getting a very strong message even before birth. Children are evaluated through scans and all kinds of stuff to see what they are about and are they growing as they should. And then the moment they're born, they're checked and they, you know, all their reflexes are checked and it's this whole thing. So most children come into a family knowing that there is certain criteria that needs to be fulfilled. And if they don't fulfill those criteria, then, you know, they're not really the average child, I guess, or up to scratch. So that's a consideration to take, that we need to actually look at every child as unique and get the brain profile correctly done and their brain organization for the different subjects so that you know how to support that child of yours. And let's look at our community and our working environment. People are all going through the school system. They all come out with the same qualification. Uh, it gets told to us that, you know, it's so important. There's so much pressure on you have to have a metric and you won't be employed if you don't. That we can easily forget that uh, a child is actually unique and it's the uniqueness that the working world out there is looking for. They're looking for somebody that's different, that can offer them good social skills, that can offer them, you know, interaction. I know of a, a, a person that headhunts quite a lot and he, uh, he says when he interviews people for a specific business, he doesn't even look at their CV, where they went to school, what they did. He wants to see that person being able to interact with them. A, a, a lot of stuff that I've read, people are saying they would uh, rather as a business get somebody that's open to learn um, and then they will pay for them to get the, the qualification that's needed. Uh, what they're really looking for is somebody that's open to learn instead of somebody coming with huge amounts of qualifications, degrees and whatever, which I know is a plus point in some ways. But it's not always what uh, business people are looking for. They're looking more for somebody they can get on with, somebody that's open to learn, somebody that's listening. I think it's important to remember that we actually have to develop a child's individuality. Just a little bit of a uh, piece out of the dominance factor. Uh, I just want to read it to you. It is important that uh, there should be no judgment about people because of their learning preferences. Everyone has the capacity to learn, but tend to learn in their own unique ways. The last thing we need in education is more misleading and limiting labels. Knowing the elegant flexibility and adaptability of the human being, the brain organizations give us a starting point for further understanding. I think of these brain organizations simply as a mo models that help us to honor each learner so we can create an optimal learning environment that supports each learner's ability to access and work from their integrated whole brain state. So it's so important to understand that if you do the correct movements that you can get the child's whole brain functioning and coming on board. So you're working on the physical components. Another thing that we also looking at children and the uniqueness, there's a lot of pressure on primary school children to perform. And as adults, let's look at that a little bit more in the big picture kind of way. Uh, think about it. When last has somebody asked you about your grade seven 
marks. Has anybody asked you how well you did in grade seven and give, offered you a job or some kind of work based on that? And if you look at it logically, nobody really cares. They want to know you've got a matric. They want to know they can get on with you. And that is the criteria that's out there. So remember to see your child if they're not performing 100% in every subject. Remember, while they're little, work on those physical components. Strengthen those to get your child that they can specialize more and become the unique individuals that they were supposed to. So um, the question number seven is, what are the preferences for each child that we need to take into consideration? So each child is different. So we have got two brain profiles that we've showed here. And what we can see is basically the same senses are in the child at the top as in the parent at the bottom. So they've got the same leading eye, hand and foot and ear, but what we see is they've got different sides of the brain. The, the child has got the right brain and the mom has got the left. Now, what is so interesting is where the senses are actually touching the side of the brain is where possible learning barriers can form. And we see that the, the, the child can easily become what we call one-sided or, or what we call I have a challenge in what they see and how they communicate and how they step into new learning due to the fact that the eye and the hand and the foot is touching or is on the same side as the leading brain. For this child, if they get stressed, they can mostly just hear because we can see that the, the left ear is open. So what we see with the mum is the mom has got the left hemisphere leading and that is touching that left ear. So she is struggling to hear, but she's able to see easily the detail, uh, communicate and step in. So for her, when she gets stressed, she can still cope. But for her daughter, it becomes more difficult to cope under stress. So this is the brain profile that we look at. And what are some of the stuff, or some of the things rather, that... Um, can make a difference in that child's stress levels. So it could be the time of day, if they are not learning at the time of day that is natural for them. It can make them stressed and they won't take in as much information. Uh, the correct atmosphere, which has got a lot to do with where they should study, should they study with somebody, should somebody assist them, or do they need to be on their own. Then their learning style, as we talked about before, if you struggle to understand the learning style and the brain profile, please get in touch with us so that we can, um, and what area you are in, so that we can get you to somebody that can assist you. It will save you loads of energy and money if you know exactly how your child's brain works and what they prefer. It makes your life a lot easier to cope with and makes the learning for the child very effective. Okay, we've got a question eight here. There's a, a common misconception that all children who are being homeschooled are behind mainstream schools. Is this true? Why or why not? Very interesting question. That a lot of the time when homeschooling does go wrong, so we can't say everybody's perfect. Families, sometimes there are divorces and, uh, you know, it sometimes drags out a bit. So in a very stressful situation like that, it's very difficult for children to actually learn and some of these children land back into the school system and that's a problem because the teacher gets that child and they might be behind because of the stress that the parents were going through. But that's your cases here and there and that is why this kind of thinking comes through with teachers because they sometimes only see those children that struggle. They don't necessarily see the children that are doing well and performing because they don't have to go back to school. So there's a lovely website of famous homeschoolers. There's actually quite a few. Uh, you can see ones um, during, you know, like in history, current homeschoolers that are doing well, famous homeschoolers currently. So you can go and look. Uh, if you just Google famous homeschoolers, you can get quite a few websites. But I just sort of put uh, 11 on here for interest sake. So number uh, one is the Winston Churchill, um, a British statesman. 
Um, number two is uh, there were 17 U.S. presidents, including Washington, Lincoln, and F.D. Roosevelt, that were all homeschooled. Uh, we see Florence Nightingale on there. We see Joan of Arc. We see Colon Colonel Sanders from KFC. Uh, we see David Livingstone. Um, so you can go and look. And one of the most interesting ones that have uh, been homeschooled that I didn't name here is, of course, Einstein. Einstein was homeschooled, and, and everybody will agree with me that he was extraordinary and really thought out of the box. And it was his mom that brought that out in him. So, you know, go and have a look at that website. Go and see who these people are and what they've done. It's quite incredible. So number nine here is one of the most important questions about homeschooling is the laws about schooling. What are the rights of homeschoolers? Very important here that every country, if you're listening from another country, every country has got their own set of laws and whatever. Here in South Africa, our legal options as parents are government schools, private schools and homeschooling by a parent or a tutor. Uh, that is our legal options. But we do have a legal fund that represents and protects our homeschoolers. It's called the Pestalozzi Trust. And they, they keep themselves up to date on what is required of our children and keeping them legally safe. Um, like I said earlier, you can also contact them to ask them about your options for registration. So that's the base because they are on the forefront of it. It was started by Leonard von Oostrom that has passed away, but his wife and the other people that have continued this excellent work. So please get in touch with them and ask them questions about what is currently legal and what are your options rather for what you can do. Through all my years of homeschooling, these uh, things do change. So it's best to be in contact with somebody that's on the forefront of that to supply you with information. So we've come to the end of our introductory workshop. And there's just this quote that I just want to read. If a child can't learn the way we teach, maybe we should teach the way they learn. So this is the whole thing. We as parents need to learn how to teach our children. And so it's wonderful that you've listened to this workshop. Do understand there are follow-up workshops that go more intensely into the brain organization. So if you're interested in learning how to do brain profiling yourself, please can you contact us and we will put you in touch with the correct people in your area. All right, so we've come to the end of our workshop. If you have any extra questions that we might not have covered and you're still interested, please send us a message below and we look forward to staying in touch.